the pod and uh, good luck to everybody in our listening audience that has uh, Hurricane Helene bearing down on you. Always a tough time of year. It's college football. Everyone's excited, but then there's always these hurricanes. This one hitting uh, looks like the panhandle and then Georgia and looks like it might stall out in Tennessee and Kentucky and who knows where it'll end up. But uh, all our friends stay Stay safe. Hopefully, it's not too big of a wind and too much rain, but we will see. Yes, uh, sir. And then how will it affect the Alabama-Georgia game? Let's get to the real issue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, actually, according to the National Weather Service, it looks okay. It will be yeah. past Alabama, and the weather will actually be supposedly nice, cool, 60s, perfect football weather. In Tuscaloosa for the big game, number four, Georgia at number two, Alabama clash of the SEC Titans in the regular season, which we did not get very often in the past. We may get it more often now uh, with the elimination of divisions in the SEC. Um, I'm not going to lie. I certainly didn't want everyone to have to deal with a hurricane. But Pat, to me, this game is about the trenches when you get these two teams together. Obviously, amazing skill players always, but. These are the uh, the war daddies when you get into these defensive lines and these offensive lines. Uh, who wins it? And I, I, uh, you know, muck it up, get it, get it nasty. I know it's not going to be muddy on field turf, but uh, I, I wasn't I wasn't opposed to uh, to that. But what do you think? Uh, is is this a is this game one at the line? You know. I think most games that Georgia and Alabama play are one at the line. But these lines are good enough; they may cancel each other out to a degree. You know, I I, I almost wonder. I'm gonna zag zig a little bit to your zag here, and just think that this might be more which quarterback can make plays and which receivers can break plays or make contested catches. Um, because I do expect both teams to, uh, you know, to be very difficult to run against. For one thing, uh. Georgia hadn't run a lot. They have not. This has not been a team that's just like handoff, handoff, handoff. They've they've run it eighty one times in three games. Uh, they only a- averaged three point four yards per carry against Kentucky. So this is not a team that I think is just gonna you know try to line up and pound because they haven't been that great at it. Alabama may be a little bit more trying that, but I think they'll want to have Jalen Milrow do some running. Uh, which won't now some of that will probably be design run, some zone read, that sort of thing. But but a lot of that's probably going to be drop back. And if you see us crease, go be an athlete. But he's going to throw the ball uh, around quite a bit too. So, you know, uh, extremely extremely good talent and big strong teams here. But I I do expect this to be kind of a, a, a maybe even more intriguing matchup on the outside on the perimeter. Dan, um, do you know how much I've read about uh, this game this week? Zero, Dan. Okay, good. Zero about <laughs> this game. Okay, uh, I didn't even know they still play in football this weekend. Actually, <laughs> I was surprised. You know? Yeah. Uh, well, you're a reporter, and that is part been, of the job. We'll get to that. Cr- <laughs> it's been it's been it's been quite a week. It's I been like quite to a week pretend of the, uh, we're analysts field, every so. once in a while. And- <laughs> All right, good talk, Ross. Good talk. <laughs> we'll get to your to your part. No, uh, no, 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 no. Give, give me. You're a, covering give me the a, game. Uh, I shot. agree. We're not yeah, analysts. I am. Covering, <laughs> I, mean, I, am, I, am not. I am. I am covering the game. Um, I will. Uh, we'll be on on hand there with uh, Mr. Forty and, and uh, I believe Mr. Trump uh, as well. Yeah. Um, all yeah. of us will be there. Uh, so that should be that should be fun. I I uh, this game always does seem to come down to the to the trenches um that seems to be uh whoever runs the ball better and whoever um plays better on the line seems to to always win these games and they seem to usually have you know some of the best defensive lines uh and defensive fronts in the country and pretty dang good offensive uh lines in the country i think for for me this is uh maybe the the biggest game for milro for me um when you look at when you look at last year and the way last year ended right um in in 
you know, people were asking going into the season, how much has he really progressed? Can he, can he, you know, win these big games like this with his arm? This is a big pressure one, right? You're, you're at home and you're playing a top number one or number two, I guess, team in the country. Uh, this is a, this is a big game for him in, uh, Alabama's offensive line, which is, you know, had issues a little bit in the South Florida game we saw, but overall played, seemed to play played pretty well, uh, big time for them to kind of give him time. And, and, uh, he's so versatile with his feet too, you know, uh, scheming against him. It's going to be interesting to see what Georgia has kind of in the bag there from Kirby Smart. A couple little, uh, notes follow up on what I said there, Dan, um, Georgia's running at 27 times game. Alabama's running at 41. So Alabama's been much more run dependent. They've been throwing it in the low to mid 20s. So clearly, you know, Alabama's preference is going to be let's make some hay on the ground. It's just tough to do against Georgia. Georgia is not allowed a rushing touchdown this year. Alabama's only allowed one. So that kind of gets back to my point that I think you're going to have to make some plays in the passing game. I'll add just two things. One, I agree on this Jalen Milrow. I I wonder how good he is, and I'm not saying it in a negative way. I'm saying it in a positive way. Like, I do talk to NFL scouts, and there is way more interest in Jalen Milrow this year than there was expected to be last year. And the possibility of him ascending into a first-round draft pick and that type of thing, which I know this is a college we care about the college game, but if he's playing at that level, uh, there's something there. And playing in Kalen DeBoer's system, nothing against Coach Saban. He's obviously put a whole bunch of quarterbacks in the NFL, but it is a more freewheeling, a little more, I don't want to say fun, but kind of fun. There's more celebrate, like Kalen DeBoer wants you celebrating, wants you upbeat. It's a little bit different. Um, there's a lot of interest in Jalen Milrow. How good is he? And could he even outduel Carson Beck? What kind of play? And this is that first uh, real test. The other thing about the lines, other guys are saying each defense, each offensive and defensive lines that both teams do not have the depth that they used to. Transfer portal has taken a lot of a lot of guys out at the back end of these drafts of these uh, things, and where Georgia used to just run. But, you know, eight, nine, ten linemen, they can't do that quite the same. So those are two interesting things. But really, Ross just uncovered, uh, just just revealed the curtain, pulled the curtain back on college football analysis. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're going to get in trouble with your fellow. Uh, Let me tell mm, you how college mm. football analysis works. Someone mm. like one of us sitting in a little box on uh, TV or YouTube or whatever, we rattle off 43 straight names like we know half the roster and a couple stats, and we act like we know what we're talking about. Now, on this show, we really don't often talk like we're talking about, except when we're talking about the issues or the narratives, like our last show's discussion of like, what would this mean for Kalen DeBoer? What would this, that's kind of where we're stronger. But I don't care if you listen to the podcast or uh, the biggest shows on television. 95% of the people doing analysis are full of it. I don't care if they played the game. I don't care if they coached the game. I don't care any of it. If they were that good at figuring out what was going to happen this weekend or breaking down the tape, Mm -hmm. they wouldn't be doing it on television or in the media. (laughs) There's a few jobs that pay enough, but ain't many. No, Bill Belichick and, got in the media because he finally got unemployed after 48 years, right? <laughs> so, Ross, you're giving away the secrets. <laughs> I did see, uh, I did see, I think it was Kurt Warner maybe last week. He, uh, he either, I think he tweeted like uh, something about, um, you know, he, he obviously studies Sunday games, you know, Sunday night and Monday and breaks down the games, breaks down the players. And he spends like all day Monday, all day, maybe even Tuesday, watch, re-watching games and breaking things down. But there are Monday morning shows, right? And Sunday night shows where you have analysts who are breaking down the games. And he tweeted something to the effect of, how do these people talk intelligently uh, and knowledgeably about games that were played a couple hours ago when you, you didn't really watch you haven't rewatched it. You haven't broken it down. And then I can't remember who replied to him, but somebody basically quote tweeted and said, 
Oh, come on, Kurt. We're just making up a bunch of. B- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. Yes. Yes. The, you can grab a couple of plays and, you know, you know, put your little circle graphics on and say, you know, this is where they're taking advantage of them here, but that you can't break down a whole game. One thing I did enjoy was when I worked with Jerry DiNardo, Big Ten Network, was Jerry would basically withhold opinions until he had gotten a chance to watch a full game. Like he would, he would just not even go there. Get in these production meetings. Like, Jerry, can you talk about Michigan's running games? Like, no, I haven't watched it enough. It's like, okay. I, like, I respected that. Much respect. Know, yeah, so. there's a lot that are doing. Yeah. But even breaking down what happened is a lot different than me saying or anybody saying, yeah, what's going to happen? I'm going to list you the left side of the yeah. Georgia offensive line, yeah. which I can't do, I will admit, and then tell you that that's where they're going to – like, telling me what's going to happen, no. Nah. No. You'd right. be living in a very, very large house in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hiring one people of to things... make the bets for you because you've been banned. Yeah. You would not you know. be yeah, on – but this is why I actually like the internet because you actually find these guys – yeah. You can watch YouTube shows, you can watch TikToks or whatever, and there's some guy just kind of, he's he's breaking it down, like filming his own TV, he doesn't have like the All-22. <laughs> it's just as good. These spots, what, yeah. you, you, you spend, they got, they got all the dots, right? And then look, it's a mm-hmm. slant route. Like, no kidding, if you watch the play three times, you can figure <laughs> out what the play is. Is it that hard? Yeah. And he looks them <laughs> off. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So Nobody's ever done it before. We were, no, I, I mean, look, one of the things I think, especially from our vantage point, we, we we all pick games. We pick games on this podcast. And last week we did quite well, in fact. I think Joe will have some numbers for us later. But that's not the main part of our job. Right. I have people I say all the time, say, don't you watch college? Why don't you cover it? Why don't you know this? It's like, you know what? Because we're interviewing people and we're writing about issues and we're writing features and stuff like that. And, hey, you know what? I, I sat down with Jalen Milrow this summer. Really good guy. Interesting guy. He was very excited to play in Kalen DeBoer's offense. And as he said, play for an offensive coach. He said, Nick Saban's a legend, loved it. But Nick Saban was a defense first guy. I'm going to an offense first guy. Thinks it's going to be more fun. And I think it has been so far. There you go. That's our analysis. There There you go. Boom. Keep listening. Uh, Let's get to this (laughs) NIL disaster at UNLV. That's what for fun. (laughs) Woo, yeah. (laughs) Juicy. Listen, we also talked, uh, we did a, a, a little more of a deep dive on Notre Dame, Louisville. And again, again go back to the yesterday, last show, we talk about it. But, you know, we're not going to just sit here and pretend like we can. There, there's a lot of, it's a lot of it is a joke. There you go. Media Secrets 101 here on the College Football Inquirer. We're all family here. We're telling the truth. That's right. Uh, Matthew Sluka became the most famous quarterback in college football for a minute there. <laughs> So, to briefly recap, Sluka transfers from Holy Cross, um, FCS Holy Cross, after four years, to UNLV. Shows up in the summer, wins the job, wins the starting job, and uh, plays three games, which UNLV has won them all, and they look very good. He is uh, 21 of 48. 43.8% 43.8% completion rating. He has six TDs, a pick. He also ran for TD. Pretty nice dual threat, but he's throwing 15 passes a game. He announces on Tuesday night that he is going to quit the team and take a red shirt year to preserve his final year of eligibility. Now, under NCAA red shirt rules, you can play four games and anything more than four, you cannot take a red shirt year. But if you only play like, you know, three and a half, you get injured or you're only in a few plays for four games. You, you know, it's a nice, nice thing college football did. The NCAA tried to do because people would complain about guy would get in one time because he had to on one punt coverage and he'd lose a whole year. So call, the NCAA did did this rule. So some people have exploited it through the years. And Sluka is basically saying, I'm out. And he said the reason he's out is because promises were not kept with NIL compensation. Um. I'll go to Ross with the details, but the basic premise is Sluka's family said that uh, they were told by a UNLV assistant that he could get a hundred grand if he came to UNLV for the year. But in fact, he's only received $3,000 and 
And the NIL collective for UNLV has not paid up what they were hoping. And they had an NIL agent trying to make a deal and, and uh, nothing was going down. And um, they're claiming they were, uh, they were cheated out of the money that they were owed. So they're just not going to play for UNLV anymore because they didn't get this, this, uh, this money. Uh, Ross, Correct whatever I didn't get right there, and and where did this where did this all go from there? I think a lot of people in college athletics were waiting a long time for something like this to happen. They've been waiting and waiting for a somewhat high profile player to on a team that's you know ranked uh, to quit over you know over uh, broken nil promises. It's it's happened. I think it's happened quite a bit, but privately, um, maybe not. Uh, a, a big time player, um, maybe not a ranked team, maybe player just quietly either eventually gets the money or just goes in the portal, you know, and doesn't say anything. That that's happened a lot, but this one obviously became became public. And uh, you know, you you got two sides there. You kind of laid out those sides there. I mean, the the gist is that the agent side with the players says that uh, he was made a verbal promise and he he came to the school under that promise and condition that he'll receive a hundred thousand dollars and the other side is from the school and the school's collective saying uh um no nothing was in writing and and we we weren't at least the collective wasn't uh, uh made aware of that promise um and so they offered him as you mentioned right three thousand dollars a month instead of whatever you know nine thousand dollars ten thousand dollars a month whatever it would be for for a hundred thousand dollars and and that's where we are and um I think what's happened here is, as I mentioned, this has happened quite a bit, just not going public. And one of the big, it, this this kind of center of this is a huge issue, which is a commu- which is the communication between the coaching staff and the collective. And at many places, that probably a little more maybe organized. Um, and I was talking to one of them a couple of days ago, and all this happened uh, yesterday. And they said, you know, Ross, the biggest thing for us is the coaching staff does nothing with the money. They don't talk about the money to the player. I, I, as in the collective CEO, call the player and talk to mom, dad, whoever, agent, player about money. Coaching staff does nothing with money. And it's a great role to have. And this is exactly why. Yeah, Slukagate. Uh, fascinating. <laughs> um, <laughs> to me... This is uh, this is by far the lesser of the two problems that uh, UNLV has been ensnared in this week, but we'll get to the other one. Still, this is the issue. I mean, th- this gave everyone out there who's of the opinion that NIL is ruining college football, this gave them something to beat people about the head and shoulders with. Uh, you know, the disloyal player who's going to quit on his team or, you know, or the, the scammy assistant coach who makes a promise he can't keep. Either way, you know, this is your sign of the apocalypse. So realignment's the bigger sign of the apocalypse. However, sticking to this issue. Um, God, Pat, you are on a roll. Go, go. <laughs> Should I? No, okay. keep All going. Right. Yeah, I mean, I. <laughs> hallelujah. Well, yeah. We got a $55 million law uh, battle in the Pac-12 versus the Mountain West. $55 million battle for Mountain West versus uh, Pac-12 money that's going to court. But people are losing their mind over whether this college quarterback at UNL flipping V (laughs) was just supposed to get hundred grand or not. UNLV has never ever mattered and congratulations to them for mattering for once mm-hmm. the three and oh they've beaten a couple of power conference teams they have never been ranked one week ever in the ap top 25 never their best season in 1984 they went 11 and 2 and guess what happened all the wins were vacated because they had ineligible players so you know he's never done anything and now all of a sudden we're talking about him it's 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 truly wild but the bigger issue is the lying, backstabbing, browbeating, and suing for tens of millions of dollars as we tear apart conferences and kill off rivalries. 
That's a far bigger deal than whether or not Matthew Sluka got screwed. Now, for the Sluka family and for Matthew Sluka, hey, this is a big deal. And if you're a UNLV fan, it's a big deal. And it's a fascinating thing that everybody's talking about because to Ross's point, this has been the boogeyman that everybody was sure was in the closet. And now, oh my God, here it comes out. You know, NIL's a cesspool. It's really not. There's some bad, there's been some bad situations. No doubt about it. Jaden Rashada, this one was Sluka. And I would like to hear from Brennan Marion, the alleged offerer of the $100,000, according to Mr. Sluka telling ESPN uh, what happened there. Because coaches are certainly not supposed to be making money offers, although surely they do. But, uh, you know, it's just, it, to me, we are talking more about the wrong issue at UNLV than the right issue. Amen. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of national media. They don't really cover college football, right? Uh, most national media are focused on the NFL and the NBA. And for good reason. So your, your morning talk shows, your national radio shows for the most part, are are focused on those two sports. And especially when you get into the arcane details of college athletics, like how NIL works. And then you have all these people that are just, they just, I don't know what they're arguing about. They just want, they're just mad about NIL or something. And so, yes, this became this, oh my God, look what happened. We need guardrails, guardrails. Oh. Oh, we need rules. rules. We need something. And 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 everyone needs to take a damn deep breath. Okay. First off, the fact that we have two cases in like five years, Jaden Rashada and Matthew Sluka, tell me there isn't a problem. Of course, well, there's going to be a bad Two cases deal. that became public. Dan. Became public. Sure. Yeah. But that's it. True. You know what happened before when players got offered told by coaches they're going to get a hundred grand to come to a school they got given three thousand and that was it they got stiffed and they had no recourse whatsoever because they were blackmailed by ncaa rules the list of players that did not get what they were promised by a by somebody to play at a school has gone on for generations but they had to be quiet they couldn't do anything matthew sluka has ways to 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 remedy this namely walks away matthew sluka quit on his team okay i don't think the slukas really were that prepared for what they were going into did a guy say hey maybe you get a hundred grand they should have known they're not giving a hundred grand to him no to a holy cross <laughs> football transfer unlikely at unlv they didn't get a contract put it in writing they can go to court and say where's our hundred grand didn't get a contract are going with this verbal, maybe a verbal promise. They learn the hard way in Vegas. The house always wins. Don't go looking to collect your money in Vegas unless you got ironclad proof they owe you. Ain't going to happen. So I really, I look at the Slukas and say, you made some a bad business deal. If you even made a deal, you're not getting the money. But the idea that this is some, some disaster. Yes. Is it a clunky system? where you have these outside things paying. And yes, absolutely. The NCA should do something like, you know, set up, uh, you know, employment and collective bargaining, and then maybe they can get somewhere. But other than that, whatever rule the NCA people are proposing the NCA to come up with is illegal. It doesn't stand a chance. It's going to be found illegal or it's going to go to the Supreme court or as we saw the attorneys general of Tennessee and Virginia is going to step in and say, yeah, nah, not working here. That's not going to, that's not going to fly. There is a loophole here with Matthew Sluka and other players where, and maybe this is the motivation. I'm just going to say hypothetically, I don't want to put this on Sluka because I don't know, but let's say this kid was really balling out. Again, he completed 43% of his passes. Let's, that's right. But let's say he goes to UNLV. Let's say he gets a hundred grand. Let's say he's getting 10 grand a month and everything's going great. And he completes 90% of his passes and has 18 touchdowns right now. It looks like the best quarterback going. Now, maybe he would say, Hey, I'm going to go pro, but maybe he's not a pro type prospect. So he says, I'm going to quit this team after three weeks. 
And I'm then going to enter the portal because I think with the tape I've put down at the group of five level, a power five, power four school is going to pay me a million dollars next year. That loophole exists. Now, to close what they're, they're mad at Sluka for, you would either have to somehow bar somebody from quitting a team. What do you make them play? <laughs> Yeah, or you have to change the red shirt rules, which again, they did because everyone, generally the same people, screamed that it wasn't fair that a kid played three games and it hurt his knee and he should get another oh, year man. of eligibility. No, that's great. The coaches wanted the red shirt rule. Coaches wanted like, the red shirt. Oh my God. Now they're set up to just screw us over after four games. Yeah. So what are you coming up with? Yes, he could do this if there's actually all this money. Now, the risk, are you going to pay a million bucks? To a guy who quit on a 3-0 and team? Okay, that's the risk he takes. I look at it as like, this is business. Every day in business, people make bad deals. They get screwed over, whatever. There are protections for Matthew Sluka. There's protections for UNLV. You got to sign a contract. Some dude in Vegas promised me 100 grand? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> what? This is a plot twist of hangover. <laughs> and then there's Not Vegas. Only... They go, oh, we don't ever discuss. We don't pay players here. I yeah, think I'm yeah, just going to pull out an old UNLV. book I wrote. Let me yeah. see what's in here. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't like. <laughs> uh, the UNLV uh, statement mm. was the best part of the whole damn day. <laughs> it was tremendous. Just a tremendous statement. I gotta. I'm, I'm trying to like search for it as we uh, as we're talking oh, here. Us? Here, here it is. Here, here it is. Here it is. <laughs> Football player Matthew Sluka's representative made financial demands upon the university and its NOIL collective in order to continue playing. UNLV Athletics interpreted these demands as a violation of the NCAA pay for play rules as mm -hmm. well as Nevada State, Nevada State law. UNLV does not engage, Dan, in mm -hmm. such activity, nor no. does it respond to implied threats. No. No. Applied no, no, threats. No, no. Applied threat uh, in Vegas is you're ending mm. up in uh down by the Hoover Dam. That's a threat. <laughs> mm. New Vegas. By the way, let me take take a take a page from the uh, honorable judge uh Claudia Wilkins book and say you're about to get the uh directly share revenue with athletes. You are paying them to play. <laughs> <Right after. laughs> Anyway, I, this was just a bad deal. I don't know what they're doing. Whatever. This is not some disaster. Can we do better? Yeah. But I, I some of the the hand wringing and the screaming and the this, like what do what what exactly do you propose? Is there anything Pat that you could do? Uh, no. I mean, like as we've said before, I mean, look, there's two salute, two potential solutions. One is pretty much a half measure. The other is full measure, which, as you've said, employment status, collective bargaining, contracts, the whole deal, right? The half measure that the NCAA wants and a lot of the schools want and people in Congress, some people in Congress want. I talked to Ted Cruz about this a couple of weeks ago. He's, you know, do we want to empower the NCAA to have more hands-on control of this and to have, I, well, you said, I'm in favor of a database of Agent salaries, all that stuff, and I want a lot of it in writing. I want, I want all that stuff in writing. I know Dan, you do not, but that I no, think I, would. Help. I don't think the players should do that. I, I don't care. I want as much info as possible. But yeah. I, if I'm a player, when you give up your negotiating right by by giving out that information, that is proprietary yeah. information in private practice of how much we pay our executives, what we pay, unless it has to be disclosed due to. Uh, tax form, uh, publicly traded information or whatever. But nobody wants to say what they're paying. Nobody wants that. No, the player, the, the, the players should not want that. They, they have more bargaining by saying, hey, I'm going to get 100 grand from UNLV. And you go, right. hmm, are they bluffing or not? That's all I'm saying. But I get why the yeah. schools would want that. And Cruz is on the yeah. side of the schools, 100%. Yes, yeah. Not a yeah. big issue for me. I just don't think players should give up their info. Right. I just think th those are your two 
options, I think, is make them employees or, again, another half measure. And we have seen the NCAA do nothing but fail with half But measures, even then, so. if he doesn't sign a contract, what are we doing? Yeah. Right. Like, no. Again, yeah, and some- you know what? There was some confusion. That's a, This is a good point. There was some confusion um, on, you know, can athletes sign, you know, contracts before they enroll at a college with a collective or a third party? The answer is actually yes. Uh, Because the Tennessee injunction uh, permitted this to happen, Um, but it doesn't sound like the the agent knew uh, of that rule. And I don't blame them because the rules are very murky. (laughs) The guardrails and the guidelines that the NCAA put out are extraordinarily murky. And the only reason that an athlete could sign with a third party before they enroll is because of this Tennessee injunction. And some people interpret it differently, but there are plenty of collectives that I spoke to that do sign players uh, before they enroll. Now, they don't necessarily start getting paid until they enroll, but they sign them to agreements, and that's probably what should have happened here. Everybody's probably a bit to blame here, right? Like, if you're Matthew Sluka, yes, you say, hey, we need, and you say to your agent, Marcus Cromartie, we need this in writing. We got to have something. We got to have a paper. We got to have a contract. We got to have something, you know, where they are committed to doing this. And then... If you've been there, I think he came, he got there in like May or something, I think after he graduated from Holy Cross. Well, a month goes by, two months go by. I think I would have raised the issue. Uh, and apparently, Marcus Cromartie did not contact the collective until I believe it was August 29th or something. Kind of late, uh, you know, in the game at that point. And I think maybe by then, Sluka had been named the starting quarterback and he was the guy. But if you were owed money, you should have pursued getting that money maybe a little sooner. Yeah. The, both the player and in some ways the schools are more protected now than they ever have been. Uh, but this yeah. was taken as a, a, and then another player from UNLV said, I'm leaving too. Promises weren't kept. Everyone flips out again. It's like, I wasn't playing as much. Okay. Yeah. Bear right. Alexander <laughs> transfers from USC. Oh my God. See what's happening. <laughs> All right, let's go to break. We'll talk Bear Alexander, USC, and other things after. All right, we're back. Bear Alexander. Ross, do you know where Bear Alexander is? It's not easy to find. (laughs) (laughs) The Bear. Um, Great name. I uh, I got a uh, a tweet here from actually my good buddy, uh, Shane Dixon, who covers LSU for 24-7 sports, or on three, actually now. You know, I get them all confused. But anyway, um, Bear Alexander, if he does transfer from USC, he's obviously taking his red shirt. He's not playing anymore this year. If he does transfer, uh, it will be his seventh school in eight years. He played, Dan, at five, at four high schools in four years. Play has played at two colleges in two years. And... I think he's played four games. Does that sound right? In college? No, uh, I think games? he played more than that. Because he played yeah, as seems a like freshman he's played at, more than uh, played some at, at Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. He, he was actually, he made some plays. In, I think it was against TCU in the playoff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Remarkable, though. Seven schools in eight years if he does leave USC. And he'll have to also, sit out a year. He's now uh, going to have to sit out a year. Right? Sit out a year. You cannot. Uh, this he, is the thing. You, he's quitting. He's leaving USC to go somewhere else. Fine, go wherever you want. But he, he again, there is a rule. This idea that every year you just switch it to a new school. No, you got to graduate. Like there are different ways that it works. Grad transfer, or whatever. He's got to sit out a year. There already is a rule. And let let's be clear on Bear Alexander. And I think people who listen to this podcast know I do not like to highlight when a player does not do well. I they they can be making millions of dollars. I still think of them as college athletes, right? But go back to the Michigan game, the last game USC played. The key play of the entire game, third and one, Michigan's got the ball on their own 20. They have not had a first down the entire second half. USC is going to win the football game. There's like two minutes and 30 seconds left. And they run the ball to Khalil Mullings. Let me tell you how hard it is to watch tape, okay? (laughs) I saw this and rewound it. And then I checked before this show because I wanted to make sure I had the right number. Okay? They rushed the ball. Evan Link of Michigan doesn't just block Bear Alexander. 
They move Bear, he moves Bear Alexander four yards back and to the left. He opens the entire hole. If Bear Alexander can simply hold and stay and get blocked, then Khalil Mullings maybe gets three yards, five yards. It's a first down, but so what? Michigan's still staring at 75 yards and they can't throw the ball. Bear Alexander gets blown out of the hole. Khalil Mullings has a 10-yard head start to get full speed when he hits those linebackers and safeties, and he breaks the tackle and spins and goes whatever it was, like 63 yards, and Michigan win, go, goes on to win the football game. Bear, it's hard for a lineman to blow a game, but this was the play, and he got moved out. He only played 21 snaps. This was like snap 17 for Bear Alexander. He should be fresh. He shouldn't get moved like that. My guess is he wasn't playing much before. And if I notice this, I'm guessing USC's coaches also noticed this and told him, you're going to play 10 snaps a game. And he said, I'm out of here, which is good. Go ahead. Go somewhere where you're going to play, do all that. But the reaction of, oh, my God, Bear Alexander is quitting USC. Like, come on, man. No, that's he probably said, was getting they, benched. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of reaction from people who don't live in the nitty gritty of this very much. And it's easy. It's a very easy talking point for a TV show to say, oh, my God, look, everything's going to hell in college football. See, and then, you know, they'll check back again next week after they spend the whole Sunday watching the NFL. Uh you got to really kind of know know the particulars of who you're talking about here to put some context on it. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll um, it's interesting, Dan. You you mentioned that he's got to sit out a year. Um, yeah, uh, maybe. Maybe uh, he's got, got a way to play. I I I think um, based on some court rulings, the NCAA may have difficulty enforcing their rule for the year in residence. Um, it's going to be interesting to watch yeah, how that, how that unfolds. Um, you know, if he does leave strain a trade, I get it. I get it. And again, mm -hmm. yep. so uh, my point on that is you want the NCAA to do something. They did. It's illegal. Might be illegal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What do you Probably. want to do? Sorry. There's a thing called the Sherman antitrust act. Not new. No, it's kind of <laughs> serious. All right, let's get to the conference realignment. Cause this took a little, this took an interesting twist also, right? As we mentioned on the last show, Pac-12's got seven teams. Mountain West has seven teams. Somebody, they both need eight. UNLV was the linchpin. UNLV says an uh, incredible amount of attention on UNLV football. Mm -hmm. Teams yeah. winning. It was their they day yesterday. Big uh, Fresno game UNLV this day. week. We got guys coming and going, 100 grands and, oh, my, three grand, and now this. They say they're staying in the Mountain West with a reported $25 million deal where they're take the Mountain West is going to take the money, the exit fee money of other schools and pay Vegas. Of course, that's under litigation, as Pat said. But anyway, UNLV is officially staying. They apparently have signed their deal. Air Force, which was potentially leaving the Mountain West to join the American, where Navy and Army is, is staying. And so the Pac-12s uh, has rebuilt itself. I like the league. Uh, I'm going to like it whenever they get their eight. They still pretty, it's a good football league, but they were not able to get the full plan of we're getting South Florida, Tulane, Memphis. That was plan kind of B, A, B, whatever second step. And they were not able to get UNLV. So they'll go to another route. But then the Mountain West still has some life in it. Not as good of a league, I don't think, as the Pac-12, but it's still, there and the American has survived a uh, a raid attempt. What do you think, Ross? My yeah. good summation. Good, uh, good, good wrap up there. Yeah. Um, it, I would just clarify one thing: is the Mountain West does have seven members, seven football playing members. They have six full members, so they actually need they need two to uh, get 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 have to have you have who's to have the, eight. Who's the fake member? Uh, partial Hawaii, member is Hawaii. Half. They're they're yeah, just Hawaii partial member. Them. Yeah. So so they still need so they need two. The Pac-12 needs one. Um so together, yeah, they have 14 football playing members and 13 full members. Huh. 
Hmm. Seems like <laughs> merge. Wait a second here now. If they merge, that would be a 14 team league, Dan. That what an idea. You think they'd right? merge? You think they're merging? No, no, I don't no. think they'd merge. Okay. One just sued the other. Um, I know. I have a feeling <laughs> that's not going to happen. Sports, that ship uh, seems to have been, yeah. yeah, that uh, that that ship seems to have sailed. I mean, you never know, right? They're in a maybe in a little bit of a bind, but I I, I would be I would be really really surprised uh, if that if that happened. Uh, there seems to be a bad blood. You might say, um, and how things went down, especially with the scheduling alliance between the two, and now the lawsuit over the penalties and the poaching and the keeping, and uh, it's it's um, it's been quite interesting to watch. But now we move on, and uh, the Mountain West needs two, the Pac-12 needs one at the very least, uh, and so we'll see. I don't know. We'll see what other poaching is is go- going to happen um, here shortly. Yeah, now we're we're down to the remainder, Ben and 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 Dan Wetzel's UTEP miners. Let's go, <laughs> let's go, miners. <laughs> well, this hey, is where hey. we are. I tell you where we are today. I mean, it's four p.m. Uh, or uh, five p.m. in the east right now on Thursday. So, um, but earlier today, Hawaii in the Pac-12 uh, entered membership expansion discussions. Um, now the, I don't think the PAC 12 made an offer, right. And in Hawaii did sign on with the mountain West, um, just now, like minutes ago as we're taping this, but that's where we are. And that's not a slight certainly to Hawaii. Uh, but one of the big reasons that the schools that left the mountain West left is to leave the bottom of half of the league behind and arguably the, the lowest resource of those and the hardest to get to is Hawaii. And so the fact that the Pac-12 was even entertaining a uh, discussion with the Hawaii tells you kind of where they are and the position that they're in after uh, obviously things didn't go well with the four American schools and then a couple in the Mountain West. So they're down, you know, to their seventh or eighth potential option right what now. What was the fourth American yeah. school? North well, Texas? UTSA. UTSA. Oh, UTSA, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. 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 So uh, you got Memphis, so, Southern, yeah. South Florida, I Tulane, UTSA, UTSA yeah. UNLV, uh, and then yeah, Air Force was, I don't think, ever going to go, but it had Air Force shown interest, they probably would have yeah. knocked on the door. I think they showed Air Force the presentation. I, I know that. So you're looking at, they're on like their seventh, eighth different option right now. Yeah, they... The, the Pac-12 aired by not having it all completely locked up. And that's hard to do in these expansion things, but you you have to. It has to be like in The Godfather when Michael Corleone is sitting in church and everybody's out whacking the other <laughs> crime families, you know? Like, it's got to be over before anybody else even knows it's happening, you know? And so, yes, yeah, the, you need it to be... Teresa Gould or whoever, the ADs from Washington State and Oregon State sitting in church somewhere while you are knocking off the four from the big, tw- uh, from the Mountain West and you're knocking off the two or three from the American and it's all done. And then you just walk out of mass. You're like, okay, we've taken care of all family business. But they didn't get it all locked up. The gumball machine gambit, which was not a great analogy, but from last time, they didn't quite, the mastermind strategy didn't quite work. And so now, yeah, we're back with both. Mountain West and Pac-12 still shopping and still looking for additional members. And yes, ideally, like in a common sense world, which is never college sports, it's never a common sense world, but you'd probably have one 14-team league out West. But I'm glad that the Mountain West hasn't been completely kneecapped here. I am glad that UNLV didn't throw in and ruin everything for Wyoming and New Mexico and San Jose. And I'm glad Air Force is still there. More conferences who are viable to me is better for college sports. Agree. Pac-12 is is going to be good. And you're right. You do yeah. need that godfather yeah. move. Yeah. You don't come to Las Vegas and talk to a man like Mo Green like that. Right through the <laughs> eyes. Right in the eye. Um, the, the Pac-12, so they got seven. It's a good league. It's going to be a fun league. They just need one more or two. Or they need two more. One, one more. Pac-12 needs one more. Pac-12. One more Pac-12, Pac-12 needs West one more. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I'm making more. the case for, for, for UTEP. 
Absolutely. Uh, good city, growing city. They got real fans. They got a real connection to there. But, you know, you add, you add Utah. Are they good? They've been good? No. No. They're so horrible. What? You got, <laughs> you need some wins. Well, that's the other thing. You, you know, need, like someone's got to oh, come Memphis, in last. Yeah, yeah. Memphis should have gone to the Pac 12. Well, your chances of going six and six in the Pac 12 are greater than they are in. Uh, the the AAC where you can get, go eight and four, you know, with a with a mediocre team. I don't think UTEP. I mean, I think you have a nice league with this with the Pac twelve, and if you add UTEP, or you add Texas State, or you add whatever you, whoever you're going to try to add, it doesn't necessarily matter how good they are. There isn't a great option out there. Like okay, yeah, you can't. <laughs> at, Texas isn't coming. Right, USC is a, Cal Stanford aren't coming back, so you got to pick somebody. So you take yeah. a nice market; it's not that far away. You can travel to it, all that, and I don't think it's really that mm. bad of a of a deal for the big for the Pac-12. It's a good league. They've done a good job. Did they get all that they wanted? No. Did they form the undisputed fifth best conference in the country? No, they did not. But are they a nice league? Yes, absolutely. Was yeah. it a good run by Oregon State and Washington State? Yes. Yeah. UTEP, yeah. by the and, way, Dan, it might might I mean it might be a fight, yeah, for for yeah. UTEP fight for um, UTEP. Well, UTEP, fight, New fight Mexico UTEP. State. Now, if you're the Mountain West, you take them both, right? Let's not forget New Mexico State, or you go into Texas. Yeah. I don't know, but s- someone's got to move. UTEP, UTEP is a much better situation than most of these schools that were at this level. I know we're getting to like this level of conference realignment, but they're kind of on the outskirts of Conference USA. But when you go to El Paso, which is a real city with a, at least 700,000 people and Juarez makes it millions and they, they, they get good attendance at the Sun Bowl, they really matter in the city. They've longstanding tradition of UTEP mattering in that city. So I think it's, it, it's a nice move. And you don't sit there and go, well, UTEP's not any good. Eh, whatever. We couldn't. This is where we're at. Boise State's good. Washington State's good. Oregon State's good. Fresno's good. Like, you know, it's we're we're gonna be fine. This is a nice, that's a nice league. Um it was a lot of work and a lot of money to put it together, but I don't I don't think it's such a bad move for for that. I wonder just real quick, uh Ross, is, is there anything a codicil in the new agreements for the Mountain West? We're gonna give you guys each 25 million for signing on from the money that we're getting from the Pac-12, but what if you don't get all the money? What if yeah. you lose in court? Yeah, that's a good question. So apparently, um, the way I understand it, two two things here. Obviously, they have the exit fee money, which totals around ninety million dollars from the five, and then they have the the penalty fees, which total around fifty five million. Put them together, right? Totals around let's just rough estimates one hundred and fifty million. They have coming. The bonus structure that I think the Pac-12 would announce, probably already announced by the time you're listening to this, uh, is based around only the exit fee plus a, maybe a little bit of the penalty. So they're they're only right now using that money, which is around an estimate around $100 million is what they're using for the signing bonuses. And they're hoping, obviously, to get more, I'm sure, from the penalty fees, but that that's they're they're mainly using the exit fees which they which they believe they will get and i've heard of uh, the pac-12 plans to pay a portion of the exit fee each school's exit fees around probably will end up being around 18 19 million i think uh, it, it's based on um revenues that need to be computed o- o- for i guess this coming year so that we, we don't have an exact number yet but the pac-12 will pay I've heard numbers around seven million for each school, um, or at least the four, the first four, and then there'll be a loan program, I think, to pay it off. So the Mountain West seems to be pretty confident they'll get that money, and that's what they've promised. Uh, obviously, these schools with the signing bonus, and this should be interesting, right? You got these seven schools that signed on, and you're going to have unequal distribution, not annually, but just for the signing bonus structure. Uh, and I think it's 25% for each UNLV and Air Force or somewhere around there, 20, 20 to 25%, which if you do the maths, around 20 to $25 million um, a signing bonus. And the other five split the other 50 some odd million that they're counting for now um, in, this, in this pool. Um, I don't know that the other five are real thrilled about 
getting probably half of what the two are. Uh, but guess what? It was either that or the league blows up. All right, let's uh, take a break and then race for the case. All right, let's pick some games. They're yeah, playing yeah, yeah. games. Study up, Ross. Study up. Just Shit. list off some names. Let's go. <laughs> Just all you got to do, watch, watch, watch the mm. halftime man out. Joe they Burrow. Just, they just Baker tell Manful? you three names. You're still playing? They tell you three. I love this running attack with Jim Jones and yeah. Dave Smith. Boy, that, that strength coach did a great job with those boys in the offseason. They're looking good <laughs> out there. Yeah. Nothing better. It's That's the trick. I'm giving you the trick. Uh, Thanks, Dan. Thank uh, Louisville you. at Notre Dame. Irish given six and a half. 330. Oh, no. Peacock. I don't know. <laughs> So stupid this game's on Peacock, by the way. <laughs> yeah, this, you can't this was joggle actually, back and forth between uh, the games. No, not even yeah, damn streaming. Yeah. I, I heard I a little know. scuttle on this actually. This um last week, I think I think the schools um I'm guessing Notre Dame, since they have the deal with ESPN or in NBC, reached out, you know, I think um mm. knocking on the door to NBC, hey, could you move, maybe move this game to prime time for us and move it to, you know, NBC? But apparently that didn't happen. Well, guess who won't be watching? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just takes two. It, the, the, the key is, I mean, the 3.30, you got you to gotta be working the remote, man. Need two be, screens. Need, just, need, need Peacock on the laptop yeah, and then whatever game's know, on the maybe. other. On the if it screen. gets good. All right. Anyway, Pat, who are you picking? Okay. Uh, first of all, we did well in the picks last week. Dan's now 15 and 9. Joe and I are 14 and 10. Ross, hmm, you still got some work to do. 9, Nine 14, and, and 1. one. Still, still had a great week, though. Mm-hmm. Ross had a great week. Yeah, no, He's coming that's back. true. That's, Surviving. That's an, mm-hmm. Yeah, you're, mm-hmm. you're scraping back. I'm uh, five behind through four weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, five and a half. That's, uh, that's no good. Hit the transfer yeah. portal, buddy. Preserve your red shirt. <laughs> I might do that. Quick added yeah. context, though. Everyone went four and two. Pat had the five and one week. Uh, he had the best week. Thank you. Oh, thank you very don't. much. Thank you. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, interesting game. Louisville physically was superior to Notre Dame last year, and Jeff Brom outcoached Marcus Freeman last year. A little bit different story this year. Louisville's banged up, lost a receiver for the year last week. They may get Colin Lacey back, who was a transfer from South Alabama, who caught like 100 balls there last year. That would certainly help them, but I think he's going to be rusty. Uh, Louisville hadn't committed a turnover yet this year, which is a nice trait, nice stat, probably due to commit one. I'm taking Notre Dame to win by a touchdown. That means uh, they I, covered. I, vi- I, um, I visited Notre Dame um, in July, and uh, Pat mentioned at the blowout last year there, uh, that just kind of like shocked shocked everybody and and pretty much took you know took Notre Dame out of it um, out of the, ra- the 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 playoff race. And I, when I visited in July, that that game came up with people there. Um, they they remember that one, and I'm gonna agree with Pat. I I think uh, I think Notre Dame rolls and, and covers in this one uh, with with that in the back of their mind. Last year's blowout down there. My pick for this is purely inspired by the fact that I, I mentioned this a couple of weeks Notre ago. I'm a Notre Dame fan. Um, I don't trust them. I absolutely <laughs> do not trust them to play well in this game. Everything that you guys just guys just said makes too much sense. Logic does not show up for some reason when Notre Dame has these must win games, and for some reason, it also their biggest gaffes tend to keep happening at home. I don't trust them at the very least. I feel like Louisville is going to cover this game. Their defensive line is deep. It's nasty. Uh, Renee Conga is an underrated player. We know that Ashton Gelati is really good. Thor Griffith is super strong in the interior. Notre Dame's offensive line, a little banged up in the inside at both those guard spots. So I- I'm not trusting ND. I-, I have to save myself a little bit of frustration here if they fail to cover or they lose. This is Dan, did you hear all Jason. those names? Yeah, he just rattled off the names. Joe's right. <laughs> I-, I did the bit that you uh, I told you. <laughs> Uh, it's. I tell you, what? I actually know the names though. Like I'm yeah. not just saying. Joe sh- does. <laughs> Joe <laughs> does. Yeah, no, he's not just saying. Sh- he's right. Uh, well, you know, you just write down three names. You see how they all have pieces of paper? Like they're always on there with all their paper. 
Ooh, um, who's they? Paper. What? <laughs> Who? What are you the talking analysts. about? The, the analysts. analysts. You know what, analysts. You know I'm what not going to call Dan? out anyone because some of them actually, I was saying. You, you know what I have in front of me, Dan? I'm at grandma's house and I'm hmm. sitting at her uh, a home, cocktail, yeah, probably. You know? No, actually, oh. no. Uh, although that's a good guess. Um, uh, this is her makeup <laughs> counter that I'm, I'm hmm. working from. So I'll have a uh. lipstick. Okay. I have a lipstick. All right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> that's what I'm working with there, Dan. <laughs> Notre Dame has to run the ball. I I, I don't think they're going to run the ball that well. I, six and a half too much. I'm taking Louisville. Okay, there. You're the your lone card. I don't believe the motivation of Joe's like I'd rather lose race for the case, but have Notre Dame win. So he's like throwing the reverse jinx at the oh, no, reverse. Right. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. Uh, all right, number twenty Oklahoma State at number twenty three Kansas State. K State's giving four and a half. At least there's been no ridiculous bets that I've heard of. There is a possibility at nine thirty, I believe, Central Time, something's going to happen involving a burrito. We don't want to know about. Stay off the internet uh, at nine thirty yeah. Central Time. And this game is getting played at noon Eastern, so eleven a.m. in the Little Apple. ESPN. Uh, Ross, who you got? Uh, both coming off. Losses, right? Mm-hmm. Kansas State got, got whipped by BYU, and then and then Utah went in there and beat Oklahoma State. So th- this feel this is obviously a a uh, do or die game, and as far as the Big Twelve race, probably, um, you know, I, I'm I'm going to go with with the home team to to cover here. Uh, I just I was surprised that to BYU beat uh, K State like they did. I'm um, thinking they just had a a bad game, but give, give me. Um, Avery Johnson to to do to do enough here and uh and cover the four and a half. Yeah, these are two teams that it's they're a little bit similar where they've both fallen, you know, fallen out of love to a degree with their quarterback. They're mad at the offensive coordinator. But I know this Kansas State hasn't lost back to back games since 2021. That's Chris Kleiman way too solid. He'll have his team ready to bounce back. Gundy might too, but I like K State at home here. Aggieville will get ripping. It doesn't matter if it's eleven a.m. They they will put a good crowd in the stadium, get a little home field advantage, and I think they do figure out. Okay, Avery Johnson, we got. We're gonna have to help him out with better play calls with other people uh, doing some stuff here, so we're not putting too much on him, especially as a passer. K State will win and cover. One thing that sticks out to me with with Kansas State in this Oklahoma State matchup. The almost loss to Arkansas for OK State, they got ran all over by Arkansas. Jaquin and Jackson had a, a huge day against them. And then last, last week, Micah Bernard has a huge game with pretty poor quarterback play. Isaac Wilson's a freshman, so it's, you know, we're, we're not going to put any of that on him, but they had an easy time on the ground, and that was why they were able to win. Right now, this Kansas State rushing attack is still averaging. I believe it's over 200 rush yards per game. Even though Avery Johnson had a rough week last week, they're going to have no issues going up against this Oklahoma State rushing attack that I think is statistically one of the worst in the country right now. So I'm, I'm taking Kansas State. I think they cover that four and a half. Watch the Chris Kleiman press conference. He's very determined. I think I think that game, I, I, I think Oklahoma State's a good team and I think Utah is just a little bit better and that was a, that was a go. I think Kansas State just got walloped in a avalanche uh, against BYU. Everything that could go wrong went wrong for yeah. Kansas State. Everything that could go right and and went right for BYU, which deserved to win. And I'm already excited about this BYU Utah game that could conceivably be have a lot on the line this year. Um, but uh, I think K State bounces back. They're home, and uh, I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take the Wildcats on that one. Uh, Georgia given one and a half at. Alabama, 7.30, Eastern, A, B, C. You both will be there, gentlemen. Pat. Yes, I have six words of analysis for you on this game. (laughs) Nick Saban doesn't Mm. coach there anymore. Georgia. Okay. All right. There you go. That's good. I like Uh, that. Quick, I'll I'll make this uh, quick, too. Uh, Kirby, smart, still coaches there <laughs> alabama whoa oh, oh. whoa all that? right that was pretty kirby, good kirby and alabama games man i know it, it's uh-huh. i know nick's not there but uh i'm gonna roll with the tide this is like haiku <laughs> 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 i'll make the- <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm not a poet. I'm, I'm going to make this as long winded as possible. Yeah. Um, I, I'm leaning Alabama right here. They have the home field advantage. I think one thing that's that stood out is that right now Georgia has been kind of working through some just weird issues on offense. They, they just don't feel like that same team from last year. I think that the run game that we had so much optimism for hasn't really showed up. Kentucky had a really easy time creating on the ground. But more importantly, Brock Vandergriff, of all people, who's a decent athlete, but not like an elite athlete like Jalen Milrow, had a ton of yards scrambling. I think that Milrow is going to have a big game here. I think this is going to be close, and I think Alabama is going to pull this thing out very last second. I like Alabama here too, and 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 I'm probably taking way too much out of this Kentucky Georgia Kentucky game, but Georgia's offense wasn't doing a whole lot to the point that Mark Stoops thought I'm I'm just going to punt the ball in plus side of the field on fourth down instead of going for it because he thought I'm going to get this stop and get the ball back. Um, and that was the confidence level he had that his defense could stop him. Alabama's defense is, uh, I would imagine, better than Kentucky. And that short, that Kentucky result uh, scared me. If I'm going to get a point and a half, I will take it. I'll take Alabama home home dog to uh, to win. But uh, this is going to be a hell of a game. Uh, number 19. Lone dog, I'll take it. Thank you. No, your lone favorite. Yeah. I know, lone dog. Oh, yeah, a bulldog. bulldog. Lone favorite. Yeah, <laughs> I tell you, if you could be Georgia all by yourself, that's a pretty good spot to be. It's a pretty good Thank feeling. Uh, number nineteen, Illinois at number nine, Penn State. Very interesting game. Illinois is hot four and zero, but uh, Penn State is the favorite seventeen mm. and a half. Oof. Seven thirty on NBC. Ain't no peacock for this. Ross, uh, man, this is a high. Uh, that's a high number. Mm -hmm. uh, Illinois has played really well. Just just went on the road, came back to beat Nebraska earlier. Uh, beat Kansas at home. Came back from that resilient group. Um, Luke Altmyer has been playing really good in in the defense there for Illinois. I think is good enough to gosh at least hang around um, within seventeen points. Uh, I, I I would imagine that Penn State at home will win the game. Um, Drew Aller in, in uh, equally as, as solid defense, but give me Illinois to cover that one. Yeah, I think we all were surprised that Nebraska was favored by that much, and we all took Illinois, and we were all like right the whole night. This is way too big a spread. I'm again rolling with the Illini here. Uh, defensively, yes, good enough, I think, to slow down and improve Penn State offense. And then Altmeyer and the running game, good enough to generate some stuff. Uh, this Illinois team reminds me of the 2022 Illinois team without a Chase Brown, but but just the ability to grind out games, keep them close with defense and the run. And so I think that's going to be the case here. And I love Illinois getting this many points. Yeah, this one feels almost too good to be true how big this line is. Whoever put this line together wasn't paying attention to what they did against Nebraska. They have done a phenomenal job, especially Xavier Scott, who's one of their safeties and turning the ball over. They are doing it at a ridiculous rate, especially the way that we saw against Kansas. I'm not saying that Drew Allard is going to make mistakes in this game, but we've seen him be turnover prone in the past. They're going to win. They're the more talented team. 17 points is wild. That's assuming that this is going to be a, an ass kicking, and, and I'm not all the way there, so I'm taking Illinois as well. Man, that spread is hard. I want to take Penn State in this game. Uh, Illinois' defense is good, but Nebraska was there was some self inflicted wounds. There's a turnover. There's a wide open uh, play True. in the in the uh, end zone. Should have been a touchdown. Uh, there was a missed field goal, and they should have had 34 at least points. Uh, I think Penn State's going to score on them. 17 and a half, though. Ugh. You could be lone lion. This is your chance. Ah, what the hell? I'll take it. Penn State. We are. We are. Good. I think I, I, I think I goaded him into that. I think you did. <laughs> I already hate my pick. Can I try to retake the I lead over here? Pick? What, did, <laughs> what did I do? Washington State at number 25. Boise State bringing the blue. Boise State seven and a half point favorite. Game is at 10 p.m. on FS1. Future conference rivals. Oh, yeah. Should be. But they got the Pac-12 banners up there, I'm sure, already. Amazing. I know I know the Pac-12 and what it once was, but the idea of Boise State and the Pac-12 is, they, I mean, man, the Pac-12 used to I hate those guys. Um, 
Uh, who's first? Pat, who you got? Yeah, I I love this game. It's fascinating to me. Washington State's been one of the better stories with their start here. John Mateer, quarterback, played really well, but he's he's also a little bit risky. I mean, he's he puts the ball out there. He will throw some picks, and uh, I think. The fact that Boise Boise could not be, possibly be any fresher coming into this game. They were off on the on September fourteenth, and then they played Portland State team whooping cough and blew them out. Uh, so, like Ashton Genty is it, like he can't wait to get going in this game. I think he had eleven carries in the last game. He's gonna he's gonna run it thirty times on the blue turf, uh, and they are going to rack up some yardage, rack up some points. And they're going to beat the Cougars by more than seven and a half and cover. How, how did we not talk about the whooping cough thing yeah. on the show? By the way, <laughs> that feels like so par for the course. Just bring yeah. that out. <laughs> Team whooping cough. Right. Good fantasy name. And we there. did. I, there are times that really good stories get past us. Yeah. I know. Like if that yeah, happened yeah. in May, we'd spend like thirty-five minutes on it. Oh, right. For sure. <laughs> two uh, two words for you, Dan. Ashton Genty. Yep. Boise covers. Man, this is this is a tough one for me. Exactly what you said, Pat. That this is it's an exciting matchup for the the new landscape that we have out there out west. But I, I can't hope help but hang on to how Matier is played. And seven and a half feels like a very large line. I know that playing on that blue turf is tough, but I'm going to take John Matier. I think Wazoo is going to cover here and maybe not win, but keep this thing within a score. All right, wait, where are we here? I forgot. Oh, Boise. I'm taking Boise. Yeah, Ash and Genty. I'm not not messing around with that. I don't need to name three names. I only know one player. No, I only need to know one player. Boise wins. Lock of the week. Who's got one? I was looking up my got, lock of the I week. Got one. I got one. I got one. I got one. Okay. Ross, get, get after Uh it. South Alabama plays at LSU. Um, two and a, 21 and a half point dog are the Jags coming over from Mobile, the short drive down the coast. And uh, South Alabama, Dan, has scored 48 in 87 points the last two games. Um, and the last game was against App State. So they can score, and I think they can score enough on an LSU defense that just has not looked like Tiger fans want. Um, they are giving up some yardage, some chunks of yardage. Um, and we saw it a little bit against UCLA. We certainly saw it against South Carolina and at times – against USC. So I think South Alabama actually hangs around a little bit offensively and stays within the 21. Like the pick, especially factor out uh, Harold Perkins, who's done for the yep. season there. Out for the LSU year. As well. Yeah. Uh, I am going to Orlando here. I touted this back on the last Sunday overreaction pod. Oh, well, you got some uh, heat this. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did. Um, but I, I love the setup for central Florida. Uh, hosting Colorado, Colorado going across the country after an emotional, miraculous win to play a pretty darn good so far UCF team, pretty explosive. Uh, and I think that they are going to uh, be able to expose the Colorado defense. The line, Joe, I, I've got it at 14. I don't know what you've got there. Uh, I saw 14 earlier as well. So I think okay. that's I think that's safe to use. All right. I'm taking UCF. I'm laying the 14. I think Colorado is a big ass to turn around from uh from the game against Baylor to go back and then travel to the middle of Florida and 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 even be close in this game. All right, the one that I've got this week, I, I feel like this is gonna bite me in the ass, and I've been getting killed on my locks uh so far this this season. I don't think I've hit a single one, which is which is brutal. Um, but I like BYU. They're three point dogs against Baylor, which feels super weird. Now, the reason why I'm a little scared of this, apparently BYU has like a ridiculous record when they play at night. But when they play during the day, they're like 17 and 19 yeah. over the past few seasons. So this could end up hurting me. BYU might just be this weird vampire team that can only be really good at night. <laughs> but I'm gonna take uh I'm gonna take them plus three and a half versus Baylor. I was seeing them referred to as the Vampire Cougs on somewhere on the Twitter machine. <laughs> BYU, they love the nightlife. They love the nightlife <laughs> yeah, there. They do. That's it. That's exactly it. <laughs> that's uh, that's it. Um, all right. I haven't found one that I really love. Uh, I can tell you that. Uh, I've gone back and forth here. I think what I'm going to do, 
I think Texas Tech turned a little bit of a corner with uh, how they played last week against Arizona State. And I think at home, they're giving two and a half to Cincinnati, um, who's looked pretty good other than, uh, you know, they lost to Pitt, uh, had a comeback against them. But I think Texas Tech's going to get this thing together a little bit. And uh, I just, I like the Red Raiders at that number. So I am going to pick Texas Tech in the Big 12 to win this Big 12 game uh, by more than, uh, by at least a field goal. Uh, Eight o'clock, wind we blowing out there in uh, in Lubbock, the LBB. And uh, that's going to be my lock of the week. But I don't have a great one this week. Tell you what, I've, t- I've tempted, I think Clemson could kill Stanford. Stanford doing the back-to-back east, west-to-east trips, having played last week's Syracuse, and now a very hot Clemson team. I like that one, too. I'm wondering about the weather. Yeah, that, right. Like, I don't know. Could be a factor. Sc- that whole area of the country scared me, so. Yeah. I don't know. Iowa State, 14 and a half at Houston. Cougs have been, they've been a hard watch. Awful. They've been Awful. a hard watch. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Probably should have taken that one. Can I switch that one? No, you picked. Yeah. All right. Red Raiders, let's go. Let's go for <laughs> me. All right, that's our show. We'll be back on Sunday to overreact to all of it. Uh, big games this weekend. Pretty exciting. So uh, first really, really big game of the weekend uh, of the season, Georgia, Alabama. Enjoy, even if you got to watch Peacock or any other streaming service. Peacock people are going to be mad at me. You can always sponsor the show, and then I'll tell everyone how great Peacock is. That's right. That's right. We're right here. We're right here. We can be bought. Thanks for subscribing. We'll talk to you later.